Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you here today. So today we have a pleasure uh, to listen to the talk by David uh, Weitz uh, from uh, Technion, Israel Institute for Technology. Uh, David uh, uh, made his master's degree, I believe, at Technion, then PhD at CMU, then David was uh, a researcher at uh, Stanford and Google, and recently, sorry, <coughs> and recently joined back uh, Technion. So David is really a world expert in online algorithms. So it's really great for us to have David here today. Thanks, uh, Kostya, for the uh, introduction. Um, before I get in, uh, audio okay for the recording? Everyone in the back can hear me. I'm not going to ask if you can see the slides. They're <laughs> very prominent. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks again, uh, Kostya, for the introduction and for the correct pronunciation of my last name, which is a non-trivial non feat. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the University of Waterloo for uh, being a, a home away from home for the last uh, month and a half during uh, uh, somewhat disquieting times in the Middle East. Um, and uh, thanks, Kostya, for the invitation uh, to present at this, uh, at this uh, colloquium. It is both an honor and a privilege uh, to present in front of uh, you know, this department whose uh, members, including uh, the namesake of this uh, uh, colloquium, have had such an outstanding uh, effect, uh, su such a huge impact on combinatorial optimization and uh, matching theory in particular, which is a, a sub-area of combinatorial optimization which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, so when Kostya invited me to give a talk in this uh, seminar, my uh, first thought was, well, of course, I have to tell them about some matching theoretic uh, results. So I thought I'd tell you about online edge coloring, where, as uh, most of you probably know, uh, edge coloring is the decomposition of the graph into matchings, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, shortly. Uh, but before that, let me maybe uh, take a quick uh, uh, linguistic detour and focus on one particular uh, letter of the title of this uh, talk, which is this uh, highlighted letter U. Uh, so with my current accent, you probably can't uh, tell, but uh, growing up, I spoke and wrote uh, British English, so some would say the correct English. Uh, at the time, it was the Queen's English. Now it's the King's English. Um, and uh, my first research paper also involved some coloring problem. And uh, you know, having grown up speaking British English, I, I, every occurrence of the word color had the letter U in it, uh, which uh, displeased my uh, co-authors, who told me, uh, "Look, we're we're uh, we're not submitting to a British journal. We should use the the correct American spelling." Um, so after I sent a title and abstract of this talk to uh, Kostya, you can imagine my uh, pleasant surprise to see him uh, correcting my uh, American spelling to the uh, uh, Canadian one. Maybe this was a Freudian slip on my side. But anyway, this is something, it felt like something of uh, coming full circle on this uh, linguistic uh, journey. Okay, so silly pleasantries aside, let me maybe uh, start telling you a little bit about some uh, mathematical uh, results. Uh, this talk will have uh, flavor somewhere between a survey and uh, an advertisement of a new result. And uh, most of this will be uh, based on joint work with this uh, long and colorful list of uh, co-authors. Uh, good, so with that, let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, so as a quick uh, reminder, edge coloring with the uh, American uh, spelling is uh, the problem defined as follows. You get an input uh, graph. And what you'd like to do is assign each edge uh, color, let's say, uh, associated with the integers, so that each node has at most one edge of any color. Okay, so if you look at all the edges that have the same color, this is exactly a matching. Okay, we'll, we'll get back to that uh, later. So this, for example, is a, uh, an eight edge coloring of uh, K8. And um, of course, it's, it's trivial to decompose the graph into number of edges, many matchings, just assign every edge a unique color. And so the natural question is, what's the minimum number of colors you need? Okay, and as uh, most of you, if not all of you know, uh, this is a classic result of Vizings, which is now uh, six decades old, that the minimal number of colors is either the maximum degree, denoted by delta, or the maximum degree plus one. Of course, the max degree is a trivial lower bound, so the fact that this is, uh, this is more or less the right answer is, uh, is kind of uh, pleasing. Good, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, algorithms uh, for finding this uh, minimal uh, number of colors. So uh, Vizings theorem and a number of follow-up uh, papers give you algorithms that get this uh, delta plus one uh, many colors. And uh, this is in some sense uh, tight because uh, actually determining if delta colors suffices is NP hard by a classic uh, result of Holier. 
Uh, in contrast to a bipartite graph, uh, Koenig's theorem implies that delta colors are sufficient, and there's a score of algorithms that get that as well. Uh, other than this, this is you know, one of these uh, basic problems on which we like to uh, test out all, uh, all kinds of uh, new ideas in uh, different models of computation. So this uh, problem has been studied in uh, all your favorite uh, uh, computational models and even those that you don't like so much. Uh, so uh, various uh, flavors of uh, parallelism, distributed algorithms, dynamic algorithms, and whatever computation model you could uh, think of, this problem has most likely been studied there. Um, okay. What's, what's the exact model we'll be uh, looking at uh, today? We'll be talking about online algorithms. And now the input is not a, a given graph. I mean, it, it is a given graph, but it is revealed to you incrementally, piece by piece, either node by node or edge by edge. Okay, so the, the, most, uh, the easiest uh, setting to think of is just think about uh, edge arrival. I mean, this is a, the most general and hardest one, but easiest to understand. I give you an edge, and now you have to decide what color do I assign it? Separate, pick a color. Blue, okay, cool. But now, we, now we committed to this color, okay? Immediately and irrevocably. Um, good, so separate already spoken, so someone give me a very uh, simple, naive, uh, greedy algorithm to try and minimize the number of colors used. Yes, in the back? Greedy. greedy. Okay, what does the greedy do? Pick locally the best, the lowest color I could use, right? Okay, so we use the lowest available color. How many colors will this use? Roughly two delta, right? So in particular, two delta minus one works, and proof by picture. When I consider the edge UV, U has already had at most delta minus one of its color, uh, edges uh, colored. V has had at most delta minus one of its edges colored. There might be some repetitions. For example, the, the red color appears twice here, but even if, uh, if we ignore these uh, duplications, we've used at most two delta minus two colors. So one of the first two delta minus one colors is still up for grabs. Okay, so a fairly trivial algorithm, both uh, the kind of intuition and the analysis are not, not very kind of inspiring. Um, gives you a basically a two competitive ratio, a two approximation of the best thing you could have done had you known the graph up front. Okay, and uh, the topic of this talk is algorithms, uh, you know, figuring out whether or not algorithms exist that do better than this trivial algorithm. Okay. Um, good. So um, I had some back problem a few days ago. Uh, so I was spending the day kind of lying, lying in bed, uh, doing not mu nothing much other than just uh, checking out YouTube videos. And uh, YouTube really knows me well because they started showing me ads for uh, PowerPoint animations. Uh, so I apologize if, the, if this slide is a little flashier than is uh, acceptable, but uh, I, I just had to try this uh, out, okay? So uh, contents of the talk, uh, we're going to start with uh, a somewhat disheartening lower bound. Um, but then we'll have maybe a, a positive spin on this and see that maybe there's room to do something interesting. In the second part of the talk, we'll uh, talk about the reduction to a specific online matching uh, problem, which uh, turns out to be useful to get algorithmic results in this space. And in the last technical part of the talk, we'll resolve this uh, conjecture, which I'll tell you about in, in a minute. And of course, like any good uh, talk, we're going to end with some uh, conclusion and open questions. You're happy? OK. So let's start with a, a lower bound. So again, what I said is that uh, the hope is to do something more interesting than this uh, not particularly interesting greedy algorithm that we mentioned earlier. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just the title of a note uh, from a uh, uh, paper of uh, Barnoy, Motwani, and Ohl, uh, three decades ago says that uh, this is not a great research question. Okay, so the title of their paper is The Greedy Algorithm is Optimal for Online Edge Coloring. Okay, so I'm uh, not even 10 minutes into this talk, and uh, I've already told you that there's no point in having this talk. Um, okay, let me, let me maybe unpack this uh, lower bound from this paper. Uh, it's not particularly difficult. It's a fairly uh, reasonable undergraduate uh, exercise, but going through this will, uh, will be somewhat enlightening as to what, what uh, we could hope to do uh, beyond what this title seems to say, which is nothing. Okay? Um, good, so uh, what Barno et al. said is uh, not only is greedy in some sense asymptotically optimal and you need roughly a two competitive ratio, but basically you can't even save one color. Okay, so the best you can do is two delta minus one. You can't even do two delta minus two. 
Okay, and uh, the proof is uh, fairly simple. It'll fit in the slide. So let's just count how many configurations there are to color a star with delta minus one leaves out of a palette of two delta minus two colors. Well, I pick the set of colors. So two delta minus two, choose delta minus one. Okay, exact number is not so, so important, but that's, that's a number of ways you could do this. And now what happens if I copy this uh, often enough? Okay, so if I take delta times number of configurations many stars, what do I know by pigeonhole principle? Sorry? Get something twice. I'm going to get something twice. I'm, I'm going to get something actually delta times. Fantastic. Okay. So delta of these stars use the same delta minus one colors, which without loss of generality, I'm going to call the numbers one through delta minus one. Okay. And now what happens if I add another vertex that is connected by an edge to the centers of all these stars? Well, all these edges have to have a different color because they're connected to the vertex V and it's not allowed to repeat colors. And all of these colors have to be different than the colors one through delta minus one. So that's another delta colors. All in all, we've used two delta minus one colors regardless of what we did. The, the, an adversary has forced us to use two delta minus one colors. Okay, so I've, I've shown you this proof for deterministic algorithms. A similar argument works for randomized. Let's, let's not worry about this too much for now. We're happy about this low run? Some more and less vigorous nods. Okay, good. So, I'm just going to have I'm going to just going to repeat this a number of times, um, and the same type of argument uh, should work. But here you pick delta guys with the exact same configuration. Yeah. A randomized algorithm you don't see. Them. Fantastic. So a randomized algorithm doesn't see this, but if I just pick at random, there's some fairly small probability that they're all the same configuration. I'm just going to do this a few times until I know that they have the same configuration. Okay, I don't want to talk about randomized, but thanks for the question. Okay, we're happy with this? Okay, well this seems like a complete proof, so we're not going to find an error in this, uh, in this old paper. Uh, however, uh, there's maybe room for some criticism of the, you know, how, how absolute the title of that paper was which is that this lower bound doesn't really work for the whole range of parameters. And in particular, to make this work, the number of nodes that we need is at least some polynomial in delta times the number of configurations, which is exponential in delta. Okay, don't, don't worry about the exact uh, bound, right? But it's exponential in delta. So if we take out logs, what this says is that this lower bound only works for small degree graphs. Okay, delta at most, say, logarithmic. Okay, and so fine, for low degree graphs, the best we can do is a factor two approximation. But what about the cases where we actually care about <laughs> approximation? As in, if delta is really large, say it's like root n, uh, this lower bound maybe tells us an additive log n term or something. But can we still get a better multiplicative approximation? Okay, can we, can we get close to the offline delta? And, uh, you know, this kind of obvious uh, uh, observation was, was, note, was, uh, was also made by uh, Barno et al, who conjectured that actually low degree graphs are the only bad cases, are the only family of graphs for which you cannot outperform the greedy algorithm. And in particular, they conjectured that you can basically get the offline optimal. So in particular, they conjectured that you can get a roughly delta edge coloring uh, algorithm for graphs with super logarithmic max degree. Okay, and this uh, approximately equal will suppress uh, one plus little order one uh, factors throughout. Okay, so just, just to be clear, right, the, so this lower bound kind of reads as a delta plus log n lower bound. So if uh, delta is super logarithmic, this is kind of consistent with a delta plus little order of delta many colors. We're happy so far? Good. So found some silver lining. There's a room for possible uh, growth. And in fact, there's been quite a lot of progress on this uh, conjecture uh, over the years. So let me tell you a little bit about the algorithmic history here. Sorry, David. Yes, sir. Uh, good. So the conjecture is just there exists an algorithm. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm trying to remember if their exact statement was randomized. Probably they conjectured randomized. And I'll, I'll get back to this towards the end of the talk. Okay. 
More questions? Good. OK, so uh, the first positive results in this space uh, not only considered randomized algorithms, but also considered randomized input, or at least randomized arrival. <coughs> Specifically, they considered random order edge arrivals. So an adversary f you know, thinks of a graph, I mean, basically looks at your code, thinks of a graph, and says, OK, this is the graph. And now nature permutes this uh, input and sends, sends it to you edge by edge. OK, so uh, the first uh, two results of this space were by uh, Motuani and co-authors who revisited this problem. Uh, the first shows that, indeed, you can get, uh, in, in essence, the offline optimal, or roughly delta edge coloring, but uh, only for a super quadratic in n max degree. So in particular, this only works for, for multigraphs. Zepper looks suspicious, but I don't know why. Um, good. This is in particular is bipartite multigraphs. Good. Thank you. OK, another uh, positive uh, result uh, was then obtained by uh, Bahmani et al., who showed that you can do better than the greedy algorithm so long as delta is super logarithmic. OK, so you know, the, first, the first result got the conjectured number of colors of the, conje uh, the, the conjectured number of colors. The second result got something non trivial for the conjectured lower bound on delta. And in uh, uh, recent work, a couple of years ago, with uh, Cheyenne and uh, Fabrizio, we showed that you can get the best of both worlds and actually resolve this conjecture, at least under random order edge rivals. So you can get basically delta edge coloring for super logarithmic max degree. Um, so for those of you teaching uh, probabilistic combinatorics, uh, Luke, I'm looking at you. This is a, a fun little application of nibble method. So if you want a nice exercise, that's possibly useful. OK, but uh, the original conjecture said nothing about uh, randomization of the input. So what can you say about adversarial arrivals? So the adversary controls both the graph and the, the order in which it arrives. And uh, here, the first set of results were under uh, vertex arrivals. Uh, the first with uh, joint work with uh, uh, Ilan and Binghui in Fox 19, where we showed that you can actually delta color bipartite graphs on the vertex arrivals. I'll, I'll be a bit more precise, on the vertex arrivals on one side of the graph. And uh, from now on, I won't uh, stop, start uh, noting this. It's always delta super logarithmic in, all, in this result and the subsequent ones. Uh, I'll point out that other than one of the results in this, uh, in this paper, pretty much all the papers assume that we know delta up front. And uh, what we showed in that work is that if you don't know delta, the problem is strictly harder. And the best you can hope for is an e over e minus 1 uh, delta edge coloring. And it turns out that we can also get that. Uh, OK, so this was for bipartite graphs. In uh, general graphs, in a recent work with Amin, we showed that you can also outperform the greedy algorithm. And uh, you know, all of this is uh, good and well, but you know, the, none of these models are really what, uh, what Barno et al. were asking about. They asked about adversarial edge rivals. I give you an edge, decide immediately and irrevocably what to do. And uh, for this, there was a, a beautiful uh, recent result of uh, Kulkarni et al. in uh, stock of last year that showed that you can outperform greedy and you can get an e over e minus 1 delta edge coloring. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe say a quick word about this uh, later on, but there's some, some really uh, sleek, sleek ideas. Apologies. Sleek ide ideas in that, uh, in that paper. OK, so that's what's known so far. So you know, we've, we've, had, we've made some progress on this uh, conjecture, but we're still you know, some constant factor away from what could possibly be the answer. Any questions up the line? OK. So we've seen this lower bound. Uh, we've seen a, a conjecture that we could do quite a bit better. Now let me tell you about uh, one approach, which is common to all of the results for adversarial arrivals. OK. I'll, Separate, yes. Fantastic. Delta plus square root delta is definitely a low bound, and I'll maybe uh, hint at uh, why in exactly this slide. OK. So let me start with the definition, which uh, maybe the nomenclature uh, is worth commenting on. So we'll say a randomized matching algorithm is alpha fair if it matches each edge with probability, which is an alpha approximation of the best lower bound you can guarantee for each edge. Sorry, this is hard to parse. Let me start again. If you want to match, uh, if you want to compute a matching in a, ma in a degree delta graph, 
then the best probability you can guarantee each edge of being matched is one over delta. I'd have, I have a node of degree delta. Uh, if I want to give a uniform probability for each of these edges of being matched, one over delta is the best I can do. Okay? So an algorithm is alpha fair if it gives an alpha approximation of this. So it matches each edge with probability one over alpha delta. We're happy with this? Okay. Um, so let me start with a painfully trivial observation, but this will prove useful in a minute. Uh, if you have an alpha delta edge coloring, then pick a random color, okay, so a random matching. This matches each edge with probability one over alpha delta. Right, each edge belongs to exactly one of these colors. Okay, so, so this inequality is an equality for this uh, fairly, fairly uh, trivial matching algorithm. And uh, I mentioned this for two reasons. Uh, the first uh, ties into uh, Sepra's question earlier. You can use this to show a lower bound of delta plus root delta. Uh, but uh, more importantly, and I mean, I won't, I won't talk about this more, but I'm happy to explain later. Uh, more importantly, it turns out that this kind of trivial observation is in some sense tight. So this connection between edge coloring and alpha fair matchings is, is basically an, uh, an equivalence, okay, in the, in the following sense. So again, if you have an alpha delta edge coloring, you can get an alpha fair uh, matching. And uh, what we showed uh, with uh, Ilan and Binghui, maybe not in so many words, is that if there exists an alpha fair online matching algorithm, then there exists a roughly alpha delta edge coloring algorithm for high degree graphs. Okay, so again, if you have an online algorithm that computes an alpha delta edge coloring, then before you run it, you can just pick a color in one through alpha delta at random. This will give you an online alpha fair matching algorithm. Okay, and what I'm saying is that the opposite direction is also true, at least for, for high enough degree graphs. Are we, are we clear about the statement? So I'll try and give you a bit of a flavor of uh, what this uh, reduction uh, looks like. Uh, basically, there's uh, two high-level steps. Uh, the first is we're going to pipeline alpha delta applications of your alpha fair matching algorithm. Uh, every one of these applications spits out one matching. We'll call this the first color, the second color, up to alpha delta. And then we're going to have a cleanup step where we have the greedy algorithm just color whatever is uncolored. Okay, the animation here is a bit broken. So uh, what, I, what we'd like to argue is that this step over here colors pretty much all the edges, and in particular, every vertex has a low degree until after this step, a low uncolored uh, degree, and so this will use you know, little order delta many colors. Okay, so uh, a little uh, more formally, what we're gonna show is that uh, lemma one, sorry, step one decreases the uncolored subgraph max degree at the rate of one every alpha colors with high probability. Okay, so I use alpha delta colors. I've decreased the degree by roughly delta, so delta minus, you know, delta minus little order of delta, so the remaining max degree is little order of delta. And so the second greedy step requires a small, small extra number of colors. Okay, so all in all, we've used roughly alpha delta colors. Dante, you have a question? We're happy? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. This is for any model. It's not it's not right. This is for any model. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm going to try and avoid uh, being you know like focusing on any particular model, but I'll I'll point out maybe. Actually, let me let me talk a little bit about how to implement this thing, uh, and maybe it'll be a bit clearer what's uh, what's going on. Okay. So what does this even mean to pipeline things? So I'm going to first give you a figure that seems like an offline algorithm, and then I'll explain how you'll implement this in an online setting. Okay, so um, we take our graph, feed it into one of these, a copy of this algorithm A. Okay, there's a matching algorithm, it's gonna spit out a matching, where we match each edge with probability one over alpha delta. And now whatever is uncolored, I'm gonna feed into another copy of this algorithm. It's gonna spit out another color, we'll call this a blue color. And whatever's uncolored, I'm gonna fit into another, uh, feed into another copy of this algorithm, compute another color, and so on and so forth. And I guess the last step with the greedy algorithm, instead of computing you know, a single color, you'll compute a bunch of these. Okay. I can definitely implement this in an offline setting. Uh, how do I implement this in an online setting? So 
Fantastic. Okay, so Rian, Rian sees this. So basically, the reason I can make this uh, work online is that all the subroutines I want to use are themselves online. So my algorithm A is an online alpha fair matching algorithm. The greedy algorithm is an online algorithm. So basically, what I want to do is instead of thinking about feeding the entirety of the graph, I'm going to feed the first edge, run the first step of this algorithm. Maybe I color it. If I don't, well, I'll feed this edge into the second copy of the algorithm. If I color it, well, I'm done. If not, I'll feed it into this. OK, and again, for the second edge, right? When this, algorithm, when this edge is added to the graph G, I feed it and basically run the second step of this algorithm A, do whatever, you know, either it matches or it doesn't, and then I feed it into the next thing, and so on and so forth. We're happy with this? OK, a few vigorous head nods, fantastic. Yeah, so uh, basically what, what I'm, okay, let me, let me give you a bit of a flavor of how you, how you prove this. What I want to argue is that if I look at the first, uh, say, k many colors for some uh, appropriately chosen k, this will decrease the max degree by, uh, what am I saying here, k over alpha. Okay, and if I can do that, just rinse and repeat and I'm done. Okay? Okay, so let's uh, address uh, Sepra's question, which is basically the, the core of the analysis which is that we decrease the uncolored subgraph's max degree at the rate of roughly one every alpha color is used. OK, so I'm going to try and give you a bit of a flavor of uh, what this looks like. So pick some k which is super logarithmic, but is also little order of delta. Okay, this is the only place where I'm going to use that uh, delta is super logarithmic. OK. Then for the first k copies of our algorithm A in this like uh, pi pi and, uh, diagram we heard before, any vertex that had degree at least delta minus k, okay, so think of this as being close to max degree, I want to argue that this vertex will decrease at the rate that I, that I was hoping for, will decrease its uncolored degree. So what's the probability that uh, this uh, vertex has one of its edges colored, that is, that this vertex is matched? Remember, we're using an alpha fair algorithm, so each of its edges is matched with probability 1 over alpha delta. Okay, since this is uh, matching, these events are disjoint. And so the union bound is tight, and the probability that I match the vertex is 1 over alpha delta, so the probability I match an edge, times the number of edges that this vertex has. Okay? Now, the number of edges that this vertex has in the copy, you know, it had degree at least delta minus k. And after k copies, maybe k of its edges were already colored. So this is at least delta minus 2k. The animations here are a bit wonky, but ignore it, OK? And at this point, we're basically done, right? Since k is, is uh, sm asymptotically smaller than delta, this is basically delta over alpha delta. So this is roughly 1 over alpha. OK, we're not quite done. Let me, let me say a couple more words. Uh, so by linearity of expectation, the number of times that v is matched in the first colors is about uh, k over alpha. By our choice of k, which is super logarithmic, uh, you know, this feels like it should be concentrated. These events aren't quite independent, but the argument I told you right here is that in the kth copy, the probability I match, independently of what happened in the previous copies, is at least 1 over alpha. OK, so Chernoff plus a small coupling argument plus union bound says that uh, all the vertices that had high degree will uh, have k over alpha of their edges colored in the first k colors. Rinse and repeat this argument, and you're, you're more or less done. If you follow this argument, fantastic. If not, it's not super crucial. The, the main takeaway is this uh, reduction. Um, again, we had this notion of alpha fair algorithms. You want to match each edge with probability 1 over alpha delta. And what we know is that this alpha fair algorithm is in some sense equivalent to alpha delta edge color. OK? Uh, good. So before I got into this part of the talk, I, I told you the, the motivation in uh, understanding what's going on here is that this, this uh, theorem, this reduction, is central to all the results that we know that made progress on this uh, Bernoulli et al. conjecture in adversarial uh, settings. And uh, I mean, it makes sense to think that uh, the same thing would, would uh, be useful uh, to kind of resolve the problem in the most general setting of edge arrivals. So just... Uh, kind of conclusion from all of this is that if we want to resolve the Bernoulli et al. conjecture and show that you can roughly delta edge color a graph in an online setting, 
then you need to be, be able to match each edge with probability roughly one over delta. Okay, basically uh, pattern matching to what we had before. Here we have alpha equals basically one. Okay, so we'd like to match each edge with probability roughly one over delta. Comments, questions? Okay, so I'll, I'll go over this uh, one more time. If I could delta co edge color a graph, I pick a color at random, this will match each edge with probability roughly one over delta. Okay, and the reduction we saw in the previous slide shows that this, this uh, connection is if and only if. So it suffices for me to find an, an online matching algorithm that matches each edge with probability one over delta to resolve this conjecture. Okay, and for those of you remembering what the uh, talk outline looks like, uh, this is exactly what we're going to do in the last part of the talk. Uh, so this animation one more time. There's a particular conjecture, a reduction that seems useful for resolving this conjecture, and now we're actually gonna do it. Okay, so our uh, key uh, technical result in uh, joint work with uh, Joachim, Ula, and Radu uh, to appear uh, shortly in all your favorite uh, online uh, paper uh, repositories, is that uh, there exists an online uh, matching algorithm that matches each edge of high degree graphs with probability roughly one over delta. And by the reduction of the previous section, this resolves the conjecture and shows that there exists an online algorithm that roughly delta edge colors any graph of max degree roughly, uh, or at least super logarithmic. Questions? Okay. So what we're gonna do in the following, uh, say, uh, three to four slides, good, uh, is find an online matching algorithm that matches each edge with probability roughly one over delta plus Q. For some sufficiently large, but uh, also small uh, parameter Q. Okay, so smaller than a max degree of delta, but, but uh, sufficiently large enough for some calculations to work out. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, the previous approaches. So again, we wanna match each edge with this marginal probability, it's probability one over delta plus Q. Uh, what's a con uh, necessary condition for us to be able to match? Just making sure we're still awake. If, I see, if the edge UV is revealed to me, what do I need to be able to match it? Yeah, both endpoints need to be unmatched, right? I'm not saying anything deep here, okay? So uh, the, the most kind of naive and simple approach to solve this problem is just to say, look, I'm, I'm just gonna take like a Bayesian approach. Uh, when I see the edge, if both U and V are free, I'll try and match with, prob with the marginal probability I'm shooting for divided by the probability of this event. So divided by the probability that both U and V are free, okay? If, if this were a well-defined algorithm, and in particular, if this PUV value is actually less than one, then I'm golden, right? With probability, which is exactly the denominator of this thing, I'll actually activate the Bernoulli with this probability, and you know, the denominator in this other thing will uh, wash out, and I get exactly the target marginal probability. Okay, so there's uh, two challenges in making this work. Uh, the first is maybe uh, not as crucial for this talk, which is how do you even figure out what are the correlations between U and V and how do you compute this joint probability? Okay, uh, but let's, let's just focus on like information theoretic questions and ignore computation. The second problem is how do I even guarantee that this PUV is less than one, or at least less than one with sufficiently high probability? Okay, so there's, there's been a couple uh, main implementations of this approach, I guess maybe two that are easy to uh, compress, so I'll, I'll tell you about those. Uh, so the first was uh, this uh, work uh, with Ilan and uh, Binghui where we looked at bipartite graphs with arrivals on one side of the graph. And what we showed is that you, you know, if you, if you rely heavily enough on this uh, one-sided uh, arrival uh, model, then you can show that whenever a vertex arrives, the sum over free neighbors of U, so V just arrived, it's definitely free, okay? So the sum over all of its free neighbors of this PUV value is at most one with high probability. So I can guarantee that I, I pick, you know, 
one of the free neighbors with, probability, with a desired probability PUV. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, this seems very hard to extend to edge rivals. It's not, it's not really clear you know, what, what is a large number of uh, edges you would like to consider for some kind of, uh, say, turnoff bounds or whatnot to argue uh, concentration. Also, uh, the fact that a lot of these are, you know, the sum of these is less than one. When I have a single vertex arrival, I can pick a single one of these. Right? Uh, all, the, all the choices relevant to V uh, are taken at the same time. Whereas for edge arrivals, that's not the case. Okay, let me tell you about a different take on this uh, approach uh, due to Kulkarni et al. Who noted that, noted that if you subsample your graph at the beginning by some standard probabilistic combinatorics arguments, you'll have a fairly high girth graph or a locally tree-like graph. And then you can use ideas from statistical physics, namely correlation decay, to show that these PUV values, maybe if you, sh if you scale them down a shade, say scale them down by say like 63%, they actually are probabilities. Okay, so what, what this tells us is, uh, you know, if you kind of go through this uh, argument, this will give you a, an E over E minus one fair algorithm, and so an E over E minus one times delta edge coloring algorithm. And uh, while the ideas here are, are uh, beautiful, uh, unfortunately this E over E minus one factor is tight for this approach, and uh, from what uh, statistical physicists, uh, friends of mine tell me, this seems kind of inevitable. Um, and so it seems that we need different ideas to, uh, to actually resolve the conjecture, at least maybe something different than what's going on here at the very top. Uh, so to tell you what algorithm actually uh, does the trick, let me maybe take a detour through the absolutely most, uh, well maybe second most trivial uh, graph you could think of. I guess the most trivial is a single edge, which is not, not very insightful. Uh, so let's think about a star graph centered on a vertex V. And now let's just see what happens. We have edges revealed one after another, and we have to decide if we take them or not. So what, what is the probability we should pick? So when the first edge arrives, E1, well, we should take it with probability 1 over delta plus Q, right? That's the marginal we want to hit. Uh, both endpoints are free with probability 1. We have to take this with this probability. And now when uh, the second edge shows up, if the edge is still available, so in particular if V wasn't matched before, there's some other conditional probability with which we should take it. Okay, which I'll denote by PE2. I won't, I won't tell you what it is quite now, um, but it's, it's fairly easy to compute. And uh, similar for E3, if, if you can match this edge, so if V in this case is unmatched, we match with some correct conditional probability. Okay? Um, and in this particular case, since uh, the neighbors of V don't have any other edges, the probability of U and V uh, being free is just the probability that all of these uh, previous edges incident coin tosses came up tails. Right? So if I want to be able to match PE3, I need this coin to come up tails, this coin to come up tails, and so on and so forth. All, all the edges before this, this edge. Okay, so this gives us a very simple uh, formula for uh, the desired probability. In a star, the conditional probabilities with which we should match uh, the teeth edge if we can is just the desired marginal probability over the probability over all incident edges that arrived before, one minus their conditional probability. Okay? Sorry, this, this looks more uh, intimidating than it should look. It's, there's, there's nothing really going on here, okay? So again, this is just what I said before. I want this marginal probability. This is the probability uh, that none of the edges that could block me did block me, so I'm just dividing by that. Okay, and uh, with that, let me tell you our uh, surprising algorithm that solves the most general setting. Do exactly syntactically the same as in the star graph. Okay, uh, with two, two minor changes. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll have these probabilities equal zero if there's no point because the edge cannot be matched. And so in particular, what we're going to do is we're gonna have these probabilities depend on the previous randomness. Um, so a few raised eyebrows, and yes, this seems a bit sus suspect, but uh, it'll work out. So let me, let me try and give you uh, uh, maybe a quick like, slide and a half of intuition as to why this works. So first of all, let's, let's uh, hope against all hope that all of these uh, PEs are indeed probabilities. So let's hope that they're less than one for every edge. Okay. 
Then, by total probability over the randomness outside of the neighborhood of the edge ET, right? So we have uh, you know, an edge, edge ET, which is uh, UV. I say, ignore all the edges beyond, say, like the one hop of this, of this uh, edge. Maybe I should, should add a join. Okay, so here's the edge UV. And I'm saying, let's take no other colors, huh? Okay. So fix the randomness outside of this. Okay, call it R. Or maybe like uh, take total probability over this randomness. And this, at this point, tells you what these uh, PEs are going to be, assuming everything, uh, assuming no one, no one blocks U and V. And so what we find is that the probability that this edge is matched is sum over all the possible random strings we can find outside of this uh, one hop neighborhood. This value PE conditioned on this randomness times the probability, the product over all the edges that could block you, one minus their probability of blocking you conditioned on this randomness outside. What is R? Uh, R is, I mean, you can, you can define exactly what uh, the choices are for the algorithm. Basically, you say for every edge, you pick a uniform 0, 1 variable and say, is this above or below some threshold? So that's, these, these random variables are, are this randomness outside. Okay, so uh, here's, here's an edge uh, E. Given what happened so far, it has some value P. I'm just gonna ask, is X E less than zero where X E is uniform zero one? All right, this is the same as saying with probability P E do something. So I'm saying R is, is the realization of all of these, of all of these variables. Okay. Uh, good, so this comes out to the denominator in uh, this expression. Um, so this, this washes out, you only get the one over delta plus Q. Sum of all possible realizations of the randomness times the probability is just one. So you get exactly one over delta plus Q. So I'm confused, PET, is it syntactically that one, or is the definition that ET is in a... No, no, uh, PET is syntactically this but where these also depend on, on the random choices so far, right? But PES, as you said, can be zero, so... Can be zero, for sure. So you are either zero or equal to that? Um, you're, yes, you're either zero or equal to that, thank you. Right, I guess this is what I had here, yeah. Other questions? Okay, if you follow this calculation, it's great. If not, don't worry about it, but all, all I'm getting at here is that if these p's were indeed probabilities for any realization of the randomness, we get exactly one over delta plus q. So now it suffices for us to show that these p's are less than one with high probability. And then the same calculation says that instead of one over delta plus q, we get one over delta plus q minus some little order one term, or sufficiently small term. Yes, no? Okay, so let me, let me tell you a quick uh, couple of words about why uh, why these PEs are small on average, or with high probability actually. So again, the core of the analysis is showing that these uh, somewhat peculiar uh, expressions, uh, recursively defined, are uh, indeed probabilities most of the time, or the, the vast majority of the time. And uh, for this, uh, what we show is that, well, okay, first of all, this weird expression is uh, at least Q, some, some polynomial term in uh, delta in expectation. And uh, what we show is that this uh, term is also concentrated. So actually, forget about this for a second. Uh, so if this was the value of the scaling factor always, then this would be, uh, flip things around, this would be like delta squared over Q squared, whole over delta. So if you take Q large enough, this would be less than one. So if you take Q, let's say, like at least root delta. Okay, if you follow the calculation, that's great. If not, all I'm saying is, so long as the scaling factor is large-ish, we're, we're, we're in good shape. So we want to show that this is concentrated. Uh, unfortunately, things here are very peculiar because these p's are dependent on randomness so far, and definitely we're very far away from sums of independent or negatively correlated variables, which allow applying Chernoff. Uh, so what we do instead is we relate uh, these, uh, this uh, scaling factor to a low variance and small step martingale. And then we appeal to Friedman's inequality and we're basically done. So if you've, if you've never heard Friedman's inequality, uh, then this is uh, by analogy, right? So Azuma's inequality is the Martingale counterpart to Hofding's inequality. 
uh, Friedman's inequality is the Martingale equivalent of Bernstein. Okay, so if you have low variance, then you can still show concentration, even if you're uh, the sum of uh, many variables. Uh, in particular, maybe I'll, I'll point out this Martingale uh, develops in uh, roughly like delta squared many steps, which is just basically too, too many for us to apply uh, azumas. Okay, too, more technical than I wanted to get into, sorry. Okay, so uh, just to kind of wrap up, if we take uh, Q sufficiently large but still little order of delta, then uh, this uh, step over here implies that with high probability all of these P's are less than one, and plugging that, in, plugging that into the calculation from the previous slide, instead of getting one over delta plus Q exactly, we get roughly one over delta plus Q, which is what we were uh, aiming for to begin with. Okay, I'll, I'll assume no questions for this uh, technical part, and that's uh, great because this is the end of the technical part of the talk. Uh, let me tell you uh, maybe what are some fun things to uh, take away from this and some other extensions I won't go into detail, to, uh, won't go into detail of. Uh, so first of all, uh, again, the first part of the talk was showing that for low degree graphs, the trivial algorithm is the best thing you could, you could hope for. And the takeaway of this uh, work is that uh, not only is the problem easier when the degree is higher, it's actually essentially as easy as offline. So in an offline setting, you can delta plus one color graph. Uh, here you can get close to delta. So delta plus little order of delta. Okay, so this is the, the main result of our work. There exists an online edge coloring algorithm that for any super logarithmic max degree graph gets basically delta colors. Okay, uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll maybe say a couple of quick words about some extensions. Uh, so we have a similar flavor of results for uh, list edge coloring and for local edge coloring, both of which I'll define shortly. And uh, moreover, there's actually a more general machinery than what I told you about these uh, roughly one fair uh, matching algorithms. We can actually round fractional matchings with a low L infinity norm almost losslessly in an online setting. Okay, and I'll make it clear what that is. Uh, but I think this is uh, probably, uh, out of all the things that we show in this work, I think this is probably what's likeliest to have more applications uh, down the line. For those of you who like to think about online problems. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about list edge coloring and about local edge coloring. Uh, so first of all, yeah, we got a, an online counterpart to this uh, classical uh, list result uh, of, uh, list, uh, list coloring result of Khan. So I'll, I'll remind you a list edge coloring of a graph. Uh, basically the input is in addition to the graph, every edge has a list of colors you can color it with. Okay, so if you think about the regular coloring problem, uh, the list in general is, uh, say, like all the, all the integers, okay? And you'd like to minimize the maximum color used. In uh, list edge coloring, you know, these lists could be anything. It could be this joint, could be the same. And uh, what you'd like to do is just color the graph so that each edge is colored with one of the colors in its list. Okay? And uh, I guess it's, it's natural to assume, you know, if they all have the same list of the colors one through delta plus one, then you can edge color, you can edge color it, right? That's, a, that's Wissing's theorem. And the natural question is, you know, if, I, if, if these lists start being different, it feels like you're, you're only in better shape, right? It's only easier, because they're less likely to kind of in, interfere with each other. So a uh, big conjecture in the area is that so long as the list is of size delta plus one, then you can just color, okay? So long as everyone has a list delta plus one, uh, so Kahn showed that this result is true asymptotically. So uh, for any epsilon, there's a sufficiently large delta such that you can edge color a graph if all the lists have size delta times one plus epsilon. Okay. Uh, so what we show uh, in this work is that you can do something maybe kind of uh, morally similar, although uh, quantitatively a little uh, different. So in particular, if all these lists have size, you know, greater than delta, and delta is sufficiently large, which is something that we kind of need even if the lists were the same, uh, by, by the lower bound of Bernoulli et al., then uh, you can edge color in an online setting. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, emphasize everything that's read on this slide is the differences compared to the known results. Questions about this? Okay, so let me, let me tell you about uh, recent exciting uh, development of uh, Christiansen's from uh, uh, this year's stock. 
So in uh, local edge coloring, you'd like to edge color the graph, but in addition, for every edge UV, you'd like to color this edge with the lowest color you could possibly color it. Okay, that, that phrasing doesn't really make sense, but you'd, you'd like to color it with a color that's somehow only a function of local information. Right? I can definitely color it using the max degree plus one. And uh, so if you think about a star, okay, maybe that's not quite uh, max degree plus one, but uh, this node that has degree delta implies that one of these low degree nodes uh, has to see an edge of color delta incident on it. Okay. So what Christensen's uh, result shows is that in some sense, this is the only obstruction to having a low color for a particular edge. And in particular, what you can guarantee is that each edge has a color which is not greater than the maximum degree of either of its endpoints, plus one. This is a very, uh, very uh, elegant generalization of uh, Vizings. And uh, what we show in our work is that you can essentially get the same thing up to maybe uh, you know, some, some red terms. So in particular, in an online setting, you can color each edge UV with color which is roughly the maximum uh, degree on an edge, plus some polylog term. Okay, and again, these uh, you know, one plus little order one terms are unavoidable uh, because of the delta plus root delta lower bound I told separate about earlier, and the polylog n terms are also similar, uh, similarly inevitable for low degree uh, graphs. Fantastic. Uh, let me tell you one quick thing about a uh, powerful tool which I think uh, you might find useful, hopefully, or someone in this audience might find useful, which is underlying all of these results is a, an online rounding algorithm for fractional matchings of bounded L infinity norm. So the input is the following. We get pairs of edges and values. So I tell you, edge, here's edge one, here's a value associated with it, x1. Here's edge two, a value associated with it, x2. And I'm guaranteed that x is a, uh, well, it's not quite in the matching polytope. If it's a bipartite graph, it is the matching polytope. It's, well, it's in the bi bipartite matching polytope. Okay, so every uh, vertex has sum of values incident on it, which is at most one. And in addition, I tell you that the maximum value I see is some little order one term. Okay, so I, I'd like to round this. Uh, I'll, I'll point out that without this uh, second uh, guarantee, I couldn't round this if this were a general graph. Right, so, all right, at least I couldn't round this uh, very well, so think of uh, like a triangle graph with values a half. So uh, what we show is that you can basically round such a fractional matching in an online setting without losing anything. So every edge uh, t, every edge et, can be matched with probability roughly xt. So one minus little order of one times that. And I'll, I'll mention again, I think this is probably uh, the tool that's likeliest to find some applications down the line. And uh, as a quick application, uh, we show that this also allows us to get some edge coloring results for unknown delta. Uh, there's, there's definitely some other applications out there. This is like the, the closest one to the main theme of this, uh, of this result. So you can get better than greedy edge coloring under vertex arrivals, even if you don't know delta up front. So sorry, you can run this on general graphs and you are getting the matching, which is... Basically the same size. This, this, this second point is, is exactly, right? So same, same as your uh, ICALP 22 paper, right? Same, uh, same flavor. You, you have this like bounded uh, value on each edge. No, it's worried about gross on constraints. Right, 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 uh, good, good. So this is a good place to talk about this, right? So uh, uh, home of Edmonds. Uh, so you might be wondering about like why you can even round this. Uh, what about blossom constraints? Well, this, this uh, second guarantee over here says that if I scale down a, a shade then I actually satisfy all the blossom constraints. Okay, so that kind of corresponds to this one minus little order one here. If you got that, that's great. If not, don't, don't worry about it. Let me, let me instead tell you about some, uh, what I find are exciting open questions that are, still remain in this space. Uh, so something that was asked uh, fairly early in the talk is uh, what about deterministic algorithms? And as I mentioned, we know no deterministic algorithms in this space. All the algorithms that we know crucially rely on randomization. It would be very interesting to understand what, online what deterministic online algorithms can do here beyond just a trivial, let me just pick the lowest available color. Um, good. 
Other than that, some other questions that are maybe less uh, like flashy soundbite, but I think still, still uh, speak to some uh, poor understanding of this problem. Uh, the first is uh, correct asymptotics. So I, showed, I told you that we can get a delta plus little order of delta coloring. I didn't quite tell you what this little order delta is. So we know that this uh, little order delta term is at least root delta, and our recent algorithm shows that it's at most delta to the 3 4 times some polylog terms. What is, what is the correct uh, term here, I think, would, would speak uh, volumes to our understanding of uh, these types of problems. It's actually even not super clear to me that log n is necessary in these bounds. So this is, uh, OK, delta to the 3 4 times, say, like root of log n. It seems that log n is, is kind of inevitable here. Um, definitely, the, the overall term should come out to log n if, if delta is small enough, but, but really, we, we don't understand well enough. Uh, secondly, um, I guess for lower bounds, uh, this is what uh, Sepper was asking earlier about uh, randomized algorithms. If you actually go through this argument, it doesn't quite work out for delta equals log n. It does work out for some super constant delta. So the same type of uh, lower bound that I showed you before, if, if you're looking for a nice puzzle, think about how to make this work. Uh, for delta at most, say, like root log n. Kind of the natural thing works out. Uh, but this somehow doesn't feel like the right bound. Okay. It could be that I'm wrong and root log n and root delta are the right answer, but this, it, it feels like you need log n for a concentration to actually kick in. Uh, okay, another way in which you could uh, extend our understanding is uh, talking about edge coloring multigraphs. So here we know uh, some results. And in particular, we know that this is equivalent to online alpha approximate rounding of arbitrary fractional matchings. OK, uh, so I guess uh, this is a uh, joint work with uh, Sefi and Arvind. Uh, we kind of pointed out this uh, connection. And we also show that for a bipartite online uh, alpha delta edge coloring or bipartite alpha approximate rounding, uh, the best value of alpha is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.6. Um, the numbers are less ugly than what I've written right now, but just to Get you, give you a sense that there's something, something out there. Um, we don't know what the right alpha is. Uh, we don't quite understand what's going on in general graphs. I think there's, there's definitely room to say something uh, informative about, about this problem. Uh, OK, and with that, let me conclude. And thank you for your time. Hi. Uh, what about hypergraphs? What about hypergraphs? Uh, that's a good, great question. I don't know. So long, long and short of it. Kostya, you had a question. Oh, yeah, I had a question. With this pipeline approach, I'm a bit confused how you're going to pipeline the graphs through there, because do, don't you need some properties of the algorithm to make sure that it's somehow consistent on like super graph, uh, like because you will be plugging I'm a bit confused, but yeah, by this pipeline thing, mm -hmm. because if I'm plugging in the smaller graph and it gives me some coloring, yes, and then I introduce an edge and it gives me completely different coloring, how am I going to marry those two things? Mm -hmm. I see. So um, I'll, I'll maybe reiterate the question uh, very quickly. Uh, there's a question of how do you make things uh, consistent across these different calls of the algorithm. So these, these different algorithms are matching algorithms. And I make sure that basically, you know, I feed an edge to this algorithm. If it colors this edge, I no longer consider it. This is a, a color. Alternatively, I, you know, it isn't colored, and then I'll feed it to the next uh, thing. And all of these are matchings, right? So this outputs a matching, so that's a coloring. Uh, this is a color, th sorry, that's a color, this is another color, so on and so forth. They're all disjoint and, um, at the end of the day, I've colored everything. So that's, that's what I was shooting for, right? I'm about like the second iterations when you will increase add the edge again. And then uh, as far as I understood, you will, edge will come and you will add it to the graph G uh -huh. and will play the game again. And now the first color, the first matching that is output mm -hmm. might be completely different from the first matching that was output in the previous step. Ah, good, good, good. OK. So the, the question basically boils down to, um, the fact that I'm using the fact that this algorithm, every one of these boxes, is an online algorithm. OK, so the choices are revocable. So when I feed the first edge to algorithm A, it either colors it or doesn't color it. And then when I feed it the second edge, that does not change the previous choice. So if the edge went down the pipeline here, then, then you're done. If not, yeah. Thanks. I got it, yes. Thanks. Any other questions? 
Rian, please. It's first. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go by proximity or laziness, yes. <laughs> OK. Can you say anything about the random grid coloring? And that's so when you pick a random edge, uh, sorry, random color for each edge? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. I'll maybe uh, jump back to the conjecture slide. Uh, so a separate question was, what about the random I guess it's not greedy so much. What about the like, most natural, OK, let's call it randomized greedy algorithm, which says, look, I'm starting with a small palette, say delta plus root delta colors. And now whenever I see an edge, I just pick one of these at random, or I guess one, one of the available colors at random. Good. Uh, that was actually even, a, if, you, if you want to be more precise, that was exactly the conjecture of Bruno et al, that that algorithm works. We have no clue how to think about that algorithm. I think that's, e that's over e minus one is that algorithm, no? So, so the uh, no, no, no. Even even that is not known. It's not known that this algorithm does better than two delta. Really, the correlation decay algorithm is not. It's that? not that. It's a different okay. thing. Yeah. Well, so that's that's a that's a fantastic question. I think, I mean, it, it doesn't seem that there's. Well, I guess that could maybe affect the asymptotics, right? So maybe understanding this algorithm could plausibly give a delta plus root delta log n. Uh, bound, which seems closer to what the, the right answer should be. Yeah. Uh, Rian, any other question? There's a point where you said that you're solving the fractional matching LP. How do you do that online? Uh -huh, I see. Uh, so for this, good. So the question is, how do you solve the fractional matching LP online for known delta, where the fractional matching I'm going for is just give a value of 1 over delta to every edge, this is trivial, right? So let me, let me maybe go back to the rounding, uh, rounding slide. Good. So just to make it clear also how this generalizes the, the one like the key technical result I told you about, here's a simple fractional matching that has uh, you know, value little order of one. Give every edge a value one over delta. Okay, so this is clearly satisfies this, clearly satisfies this, Nothing in this sleeve, nothing in this sleeve. Um, so the fact that I can round it up to one minus little order of one gives me exactly an algorithm that matches each edge with probability roughly one over delta. OK. Nice. OK. Uh, any further questions? Maybe one last question. Um, OK, then we can take questions offline. Thanks again. Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>